Uh, I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 3, 1 through 9, if you have it with you, or if you have it on your phone or your uh, personal device. And um, I want to talk to you about the topic of the mystery of our calling. On the uh, PowerPoint, you'll see a, a picture I took of a lady in her boat. Um, the last time I was uh, uh, out on a missionary trip, I was taken to a place where there were six missionary families who were preaching the gospel uh, among a people group that had never received the gospel before. There was not a single member of that ethnic group who had ever been a Christian in all of history. And so they had gone to this place. It was an extremely difficult task. They'd been there for about a year, and they had not yet seen anyone come to faith in Christ yet. They were, they were struggling financially. There were many other uh, difficulties that they were passing through, uh, being away from their families, away from their culture, away from their language. And um, I had gone there to speak at their missionary retreat. And before I got to go and meet those missionaries, uh, the people who were sponsoring me and who had invited me there took me on a tour of the people group to see the people that were being reached with the gospel. And so we got on a boat uh, early, early in the morning before the sunrise, and it was just mystical, the, the atmosphere in which we uh, went up that river and came to a place where there was a, a floating market where every day the, the people of that place would come in their, in their canoes, their boats, full of produce like the lady you, you see there in the picture, and they would sell in that place and uh, make a living for their families. And as I looked at this particular lady and snapped that picture with my cell phone, I, I felt such a sense of identification with her. She had gotten up early, early in the morning, as she probably does every day, had filled her boat and gone to that place to sell her produce. And I thought, why would she do that? I mean, I hate getting up before sunlight. If God would have wanted us to get up before sunlight, he would have made us differently than we are. I mean, that doesn't appeal to me at all to be up before the sun. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't have gone to see them in that market if I had not been obligated to do so by courtesy. But why was it that she was willing every morning to get up and go to that market? And I realized that people that she loved were depending on her, that she did it for her family. It made me remember my father when once I asked him, Father, Dad, why do you get up in the morning at 4.30 in the morning to get in the car and, and go off to the paper mill to work every day like this? Why, how can you do it? I hated getting up and do it because I, I asked him one day as we were driving into the paper mill. <laughs> he said, Joe, I've got mouths to feed. And I realized that all through my dad's life, he had worked because of me. And I know that same feeling towards my own children. There's nothing I wouldn't do to make sure they had, that they have what they need. And of course, she the same, taking care of her family in an advanced age. And I just felt such a sense of commonness with her, a sense of humanity with her. And as I thought about her and her people group and the missionaries who had gone there to, to reach her and others like her with the gospel, I discerned a mystery that I'll tell you about in a few moments. But first I want to go to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9 for the reading of God's word today. And I invite you to stand up to read the passage with me. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Listen to the word of God. For this reason, I am Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. Which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Right. 
and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. May God make the, re- the word of God real to you today and change your life. Amen. You may be seated. Four times in this passage, Paul uses the word mystery, and he declares forthrightly what the mystery is. And that is in verse 6. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel. Now, Paul talks about mystery a lot, and he mentions many different mysteries of the gospel in his letters. And I would, I would explain that a mystery is not just something that you didn't know. A mystery is something that you can't know even if you're told about it. That you can't fully understand even if someone were to explain it to you. Because mysteries are something that are more than just undiscovered truths. They're truths that are so deep that human reason cannot fully understand them. One of those mysteries is the mystery of predestination versus free will. Am I the sum of my choices? Or am I simply that which God or nature created me to be before I was born? And I'm just playing it out as it comes. Which is it? Are we free or are we destined? This is a question that human reason cannot answer. As a matter of fact, For thousands of years, philosophers, not just theologians, but philosophers have pondered this question. And no one yet has been able to come up with an answer that the other philosophers agreed with, which has kept philosophers in business for years. (laughs) Because if everybody agreed with each other, there wouldn't be anything left to discuss. But yet, physicists are the same. Physicists have explored reality down to the subatomic level, and they cannot tell us whether things are predestined or whether they are a result of randomness or chance or free will. If you look at the, if you look at the macro level of things, the large scale things, it looks like things may be determined. But if you look at things in the very interior of the atom, at the most basic level, things seem to be completely random. Which is it? Even the great physicist Stephen Hawking in one of his books says that we simply cannot ever know. And theologians have argued about the questions for millennia. Are we free-willed or are we predestined? And anyone who thinks they know the answer to that is wrong. Because it's a mystery that goes beyond our ability to understand it. Another one is the mystery of the Trinity. I mean, I can tell you that God is three... Persons, one God in three persons. Well, I could try to tell you. (laughs) Apparently, I'm not very good at even doing that. But, But it's not something that you can understand because it is a paradox. It's a mystery. It's true, but it's beyond our understanding to be able to say how God is in God's very internal being. And so there are many mysteries like that that are part of the gospel and a part of life. And Paul's chief competitor to the gospel in, ancient, uh, in the ancient Roman Empire was a, were, were a set of religions called the mystery religions. In these other religions, people were told that there were deep mysteries to be learned. And they would be brought into these cults and then they would go deeper and deeper. And the further they went into the teaching of that cult the more they would have to pronounce a curse on themselves if they ever revealed the mysteries to someone outside of the cult. One of those cults was called the Eleusinian Mysteries. It survived for 2,000 years. And to this day, we have no idea what the Eleusinian Mysteries were because no one who ever became a member of that cult ever revealed to people on the outside what the mysteries were and probably just as well that we lost them, (laughs) as they probably weren't even true. But the, the reality is that the nature of religion around Paul was to guard mysteries very closely and only let the mysteries be known to people who were deeply committed to those cults. In contrast to them, 
Paul declares the mysteries of God openly to anyone who will listen. And he declares many of them in his teachings. He declares the mystical union of Christ and the church. He says that Christ and the church are like a husband and his wife who come together and become one flesh. In that same way, the church will become one flesh with Christ. And that's a great mystery. And I don't have time to talk about that today. Or our instant transformation when Jesus comes. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Behold, I declare to you a mystery. We will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And I can't wait for that mystery to become real in my life because I'm getting tired of being in an old body. I'm just now beginning to enter into my old age at 56, and I'm feeling it. (laughs) I'm already looking forward to a glorified body. I can't wait for that mystery to become true in my life. Uh, My best days are gone physically. I've got another 20 good years or so in me, and then maybe some more. Who knows? But, you know, I can feel that age is at work. The process of death is at work in me. But Paul says that this mortal body is going to put on immortality. And this corruptible body is going to put on incorruption. And we're going to be made like Jesus. And I can't wait. That's, it's a great mystery. I can't explain it. But I can't wait till it happens. Paul talks about the unity of all things in heaven and on earth in Christ. He talks about the mystery of our salvation on the cross. He says that if the rulers of this age would have understood God's mystery, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. They could never have imagined how the victory of God would be achieved by the death of Jesus on the cross. And even now, that is a great mystery. And then Paul talks about the gift of tongues. How Christians are given an ability through the Holy Spirit to pray in their spirits without their minds understanding what they're saying. I've been speaking in tongues for more than 40 years and I can tell you that when I do it, I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know how it works. I've seen it work. I've been in places where I listen to people speaking English to me and then talk to them later and they, they don't know any English. By the power of the Holy Spirit, they were speaking English. I could tell you what they said. It was beautiful. But they didn't know what they were saying. It's a great mystery. We don't know how it works. Yet it is edifying to us and good. And Paul talks about lots of mysteries in his gospels and in his epistles. But the one that he mentions the most is the one he talks about here. In in four different occasions, Paul talks about the mystery of the inclusion of the Gentiles together with Israel in God's plan of salvation. You know, I I think that that is a great truth that God has chosen to include the Gentiles with the Jews in his plan of salvation. But I'm just a little bit offended at Paul that he thought that was a mystery. I mean, why wouldn't God want to save everybody if he wanted to save anybody? I mean, I'm a Gentile. I happen to be a Gentile who greatly admires the Jewish people. I spend a lot of my time with Jews. I've been involved in Christian-Jewish dialogue for more than a decade. I, I, I love the Jewish people. I'm impressed by their accomplishments in the world. But I am not one of them. I can prove genealogically that I don't have any Jewish blood in me. None. But yet, why would God want to save the Jews and not us? I mean, I've read the Old Testament. I've been around Jewish friends. They're definitely as fallible as I am. They're definitely as touched by sin as I am. What was special about them that they should be saved and others not? Well, that seems pretty obvious to me. It probably seems pretty obvious to you. Uh, You know, it's on one hand, though, you can say that Gentiles deserve to be saved as much as Jews do, but... That isn't very meaningful when you consider that none of us deserve to be saved at all. (laughs) That's, to me, the great mystery. Not that God would save the Jews and not the Gentiles, but that God would save anybody. That seems to me a real mystery. You know, as hard as I've tried to be a good person all through my life, when I think about my worst moments, I wouldn't have saved me. Yet God has chosen to pour out his grace on all of us. That seems to me pretty simple. But Paul thought it was an amazing mystery. Apparently, he's understanding it at a different level than I am. 
But one of the things that made it such a great mystery was to, to Paul was the fact that God had chosen him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He says this, although I am the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. For Paul, the most amazing thing about the salvation of the Gentiles was that he should have anything to do with it. Why is that? It's because Paul was the arch-Jewish nationalist. He didn't like Gentiles, and it was an odd thing to him to think that God would want to save the enemy of his people. We know that Paul was born in the, Greek, in the Roman Empire in the city of Tarsus. His family, which were, who were tent makers, apparently left the Holy Land, left Jerusalem, and went off as immigrants to another land. How many of you can, can identify with that? That for economic reasons and opportunity, you have left your, the place where you're born or the place maybe that your father was born and gone to a new land. They did that, and they were in Tarsus for a while, but something went wrong in Tarsus. And they returned to Jerusalem. The book of Acts, in, in the book of Acts, Paul tells us that he as a child returned to Jerusalem and there began to study Judaism under Gamaliel, the rabbi. And as he studied Judaism more and more, he became more and more committed to Jewish exceptionalism that the Jews were God's only special people. And the idea that Gentiles should be included in that seemed very difficult to him. Why? I thought about this, and I wonder if Paul's family didn't suffer the same anti-immigrant bias that many people suffer in the world today. Last uh, last fall, I published a book called The New Pilgrims, How Immigrants Are Renewing America's Faith and Values. And it's a book in defense of immigrant people in the United States because in the United States there has been a huge anti-immigrant wave going through our politics. And I could see that coming. I knew it was going to be important in the presidential election. And so a year earlier, I had written this book to defend immigrants in the United States. And as I studied the phenomenon more and more, and as I talked to more and more people, I realized the terrible persecution, the terrible experiences that many immigrant people have had. And I think perhaps Paul's family had suffered that in Tarsus. And because of that reason, perhaps Paul didn't like Gentiles very much. When Christians began to preach a gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ and began to go to other countries to preach it, Paul was greatly offended. He was offended because of the fact that according to his way of thinking, Jesus had died under the curse of the law because the law says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. For him, Jesus had obviously been cursed by God in dying such a death. But these Christians were saying that Jesus had been raised from the dead by God. And that didn't make any sense to Paul. How could God vindicate someone who was under the curse of God, under the curse of the law, the law of Moses, the law that God had given Israel? It didn't make sense to Paul. It, return, it continued to be a mystery to him for the rest of his life. So he'll write about it over and over in his epistles. He was offended by these Christians and their message and their, what he considered to be blasphemy, that Jesus Christ was God incarnate. And so he began to persecute them. And that's why he said that he was the least of all God's people. Because he had been complicit in the murder of Christians. He had gone off to foreign countries to bring them back prisoners to Jerusalem. Yet on his way to Damascus, for that very reason, Jesus appeared to him in person, in all of his glory. Paul was struck down to the ground. And as he lay on the ground blinded, by the glory of Jesus, Jesus called him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. That was a great, great mystery to Paul. It's one he would never get over. That God would call him a hater of Gentiles 
to be the apostle to the Gentiles. You know, as I was thinking about my own sense of offense over Paul's wonder that Gentiles could be saved, it wasn't long before the finger I was, ca- was, was pointing at Paul was canceled out by the three fingers that were pointing at me. Because I began to think of my own life and the mystery of God in it. I was born in 1960 in the town of Demopolis, Alabama. The federal government of the United States in 1965, when I was five years old, declared Demopolis to be one of the ten most racist towns in America. My family lived there, a typical southern white family. My parents would have said that they didn't hate black people. They just believed that they were superior to them which to a lot of black people felt like hatred for some reason. Perhaps you could figure it out. My parents didn't want to associate with black people. They certainly didn't want me to go to school with black people. They feared that if I went to school with black people that violence would break out, that I would be hurt. They feared that I might be, become like the black people if I hung out with them that I might be influenced by their culture, that I might give up the superiority that was mine by race. And even as I tell you about these things, uh, it's a shameful thing to talk about. When I was six and seven years old, my my, my town was still fighting against the integration of our schools. In 1954... The Supreme Court of the United States had ruled in the case Brown versus Board of Education that separated schools, segregated schools, were illegal. Yet for 15 more years, my town resisted the law and refused to integrate its schools. When I was six and seven years old, I remember going door to door with a petition, getting people to sign the petition so that I would not have to go to an integrated school. I sometimes say that I was a child racist activist. That's what I had been taught. That's what my culture told me was the right thing. It's what my parents believed. And as a child, I accepted it as well. I remember at five years old, Martin Luther King Jr. came to our our town three times fighting to get the voting rights bill passed and fighting for the rights of black people in our, in our city. Being just five years old, I still remember how much commotion there was in town to the black people in our town, which were the majority, about 55%. It, the, the greatest hero had come to our town. For the white people in our town, like my parents, our greatest enemy had come to town. I remember the night he was assassinated in 1968 when as soon as the news broke that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was dead. The streets of our town and of our neighborhood filled with hundreds and thousands of people protesting and, 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 and crying out in grief. We all huddled inside our house worried that there would be violence It was a long and scary night. But our town finally saw no option but to obey the law. And in 1969, they integrated the schools. My parents were upset. They had built a house in front of the elementary school so that I would be able to walk to school because they didn't want me to have to ride a school bus across town to another school. Yet, even though they had built their house in front of that school, I was not going to be allowed to go to it. They were offended that I would have to ride that bus all the way across town, and I checked it out. It's a mile and a half. (laughs) Seemed like a long time, a long long distance when I was a kid, but as an adult, it, it, it doesn't seem that far. And in fourth grade, off to school I went. My parents wouldn't allow me to ride the bus. They were afraid there would be violence. And so every day my parents would drive me to the school and come and get me in the afternoon. And there in the fourth grade, I 
began to go to school with black children for the first time. One day on the playground, I got in trouble. I was trying to get on the merry-go-round, which is this toy that goes around and around, and you can ride on it, and children love that, of course. And I was trying to get on the merry-go-round, and apparently I cut in front of Max Holifield, who was this big kid in my class who had apparently failed a grade or two, and he was a lot bigger than we were. And um, so Max pulled me off the merry-go-round and began to beat me up, as he often did. And one of his pals jumped in with him, and they were just beating me. And I, I was a tiny little guy, just incredibly skinny and short and small. And, and uh, I had a really big mouth, so I could, I, could, I, I could get myself into fights. I just couldn't get myself out of them. <laughs> and uh, they were just wailing on me. And all of a sudden, a big crowd had gathered around and was watching. All of a sudden, this big guy came walking through the crowd and got to where, where I was and he grabbed up Max and he threw him off of me and he grabbed the other guy and threw him off of me and he stood there between me and them, dared them to come back. And the crowd went away and the two bullies went away and there I was, me and my first black friend, <laughs> Eugene. Eugene and I played together for the rest of the day. I was afraid not to play with him. <laughs> At the end of the day, we went out of the school arm in arm, skipping. We had, new, we had a new friend. He had one. I had one. It was a good day. We got out to the parking lot, and he turned left to go to the bus, and I turned right to go to where my father was waiting for me. And when I got to the car, I looked in. I could see my dad was not pleased. I got in the car, and dad said to me, Joe, don't play with those black boys. They'll slit your throat. I have to tell you, my dad, in every other way, was a perfect dad. He loved me, and I idolized him. To this day, I hold his memory sacred. But for the first time in my life, I knew that my great daddy was wrong. That far from being a threat to me, Eugene had saved me that day. That was the first crack in the wall of my racism. And over the years, with the changes in our society and with going to school with black children and children from other races, I was able to purge that instinct out of my life. But even to this day, I tell you that if I am with a person of a different race, and for some reason I have a reaction that I don't like them or that... That, I, that, 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 they're, that they're not safe. I always check myself because I never want to treat another person differently because of their race. I wound up becoming a missionary, spent 20 years in Latin America, and still continue to go there every year to work with the church and to preach the gospel. I just got back from El Salvador in Mexico And while I was a missionary in Latin America, I was in Ecuador in South America. And we had decided to plant a church in every town from Quito to the Colombian border. It was a distance of about four hours in the car. There were only eight Assemblies of God churches in all of northern Ecuador, north of Quito. And so the area was tremendously under-evangelized. And as we drove along that highway looking for places to, to plant churches... We came to a river where the, where, the, where the highway turned right to go along the river. And all of a sudden, it was like in the twilight zone. We, we passed from South America directly into Africa. It was like we went through a wormhole or something and wound up in Africa. Everyone was black. And they were carrying burdens on top of their heads like you would see in Africa, but you would never see anywhere in Ecuador. And they were wearing clothes that looked like they were from Africa. And I said, what, what is this? And I asked the Ecuadorians with me, where did these people come from? How did they get here? I've never seen black people living up in the mountains. This was at a, a mile of altitude. 
it was, it was far from the seacoast. And all through Latin America, the African-American folk, or African uh, uh, people of the, of the continent live on the sea. Where did these people come from? Up high in this mountain. And they explained to me that the, the uh, Afro-Equatorian people of the Chota Valley had come there when a ship carrying slaves to Cartagena, Colombia had shipwrecked off the coast of Ecuador and that the slaves had escaped from the shipwreck and had established themselves in the Chota Valley that no one had ever been able to reduce them to slavery again and that they had never been slaves. Well, that sounded really romantic and everything and I wanted to know more about it and so I began to consult with the history books to find out more about the, the Chota Valley people. What I found out was that that was a total myth and a lie. That they had been brought there as slaves of the Jesuit order of the Catholic Church. Bought as slaves from Cartagena, Colombia and brought to Ecuador to serve as, as slaves on the sugar plantations there because the Pope had declared that the Indian people of America had souls, but he didn't declare that the African people had souls. And since the African people didn't have souls, according to the Pope, or at least according to the silence, they could be enslaved. They served in slavery from 1590 to 1851, and then slavery was, repeat, was re replaced by debt peonage, and they lived in horrendous squalor and poverty for another 120 years until 1974, when finally the, 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 the big farms were broken up and property was given to the people and they were set free, but yet they lived in tremendous poverty. And worst of all, the gospel had never been preached to their people group. There wasn't a single Christian church in all of the Shota Valley people, in all of their towns, about 20,000 people. The more I found out about the Chota Valley people, the more I knew that I had to plant a church in their community. And I spent about two years with them building the first church. And in those two years, we baptized 400 people in the Chota River. And I think that they're the first people in the history of that, of that country ever to be baptized in the Chota River. When we dedicated the church, 400 people came to dedicate the building. And they gave me a drum. It's called a bomba drum, and it's the symbol of their people. It's, it's a drum that African fathers have been teaching children to make through all the generations that they've lived in South America. And on that drum, it said, to the one who with love and patience and tenacity brought us the gospel of Jesus Christ for the first time. And I'll tell you, every time I look at that drum, I think, what an incredible mystery that I should have been given such a privilege who having begun life as a racist, having begun life as a person who considered himself superior to black people, should be allowed by God to stoop down and serve. I think about all the effort that we put out and I think of all the time that we were there. The people that we met and the friends that we made. And how 20 years later I think of the faithfulness of those believers who kept the church moving. And I think that this is the greatest honor I could have ever had in my life. Maybe I do understand a little bit Paul's sense of mystery. Years later, I'd go off to visit those missionaries and the people who lived along that river. When I got the opportunity to preach to those missionaries, I, I selected this text that we just read. As I studied that text, I began to understand the mystery that they were going to learn. As I talked to them, I told them that even though they had not, never made a convert yet in the first year that they had been there, though none of the people had yet accepted Christ, 
that the Bible itself prophesies that people from that group will be saved. In the book of Revelation in chapter 7 verses 9 through 11 it says, John, John said he saw a great multitude which no one can number made up of every nation, people, tongue, and tribe, standing before the throne of God, dressed in white robes and waving palm branches. And it says they were singing a song, Salvation belongs to the, to the Lamb. And I told those missionaries that it was determined before the world began that people from that river group would come to Christ. That they would be represented around the throne of God. That their people would be saved. And I said to them, you who have come here, giving up your own families, giving up your language and your culture, your finances, coming in great sacrifice to this place. If you remain faithful, you will be the first ones to ever know the mystery of how this people will come to salvation. And when we get to that day at the end of time, when all the peoples parade before the throne of God, and when the representatives of this people come before God, you will be there with them. And you will have the honor of being the first ones ever to know how in the mystery of God, the gospel would finally reach this people. And for eternity, you'll bear that honor of being the apostles who brought the gospel to that people. That will be the story that reveals the mystery of your calling, of how God was at work all your lives, doing things in your life that you didn't understand, walking with you through suffering that you would never have chosen, preparing you to be the perfect people, to be here at this time in this place to reach this people. And the mystery of God will be revealed in your life. But I would say to you this morning that they are not alone. That there's a mystery to your calling as well. In the lives of each and every one of us, God has mysteriously called us to a purpose that no one else can fulfill. And through all of the experiences of our life, God has gone along with us, shaping us, forming us, preparing us to fulfill His purpose in our life. And as I thought about the mystery of God in our lives, I, I thought about the phenomenon of burled wood. If you see on the screen, you'll see a picture of burled wood. That wood is uh, from the bedstead of, of my bed in my home. I took a picture of it so you could see it. Do you notice how the grain of the wood is not straight? It's all rounded and, and irregular and different. It makes the wood far more beautiful than regular lumber. If you just go to the store and buy a two by four, you'll notice that the grain of the wood is straight and boring. <laughs> That kind of wood never graces the outside of the furniture. It's always on the inside of the furniture. It's always covered up. Nothing particularly beautiful about straight wood. But burled wood, like you saw on the screen, has incredible value because it's more beautiful, because it's more intricate, because it pleases the eye. People who know what burled wood is will go into the forest and they will mark the trees that have burled wood on them. They're able to tell which trees have the burled wood because they're the ugliest trees in the forest. They cut the tree down and in those trees, the wood that isn't burled is cut up into two by fours and sold as cheap lumber. But those parts that have burled wood in them are taken and they're shaved down to the thinnest veneers because the wood is so valuable. They cut it and set it aside in little sheets. 
Perhaps if they, take, if they make the furniture all from the same tree, they'll take that wood that is straight, that has the straight grains, and they'll lay those veneers over it to decorate them, to make the wood more beautiful so that it can be made into valuable furniture. And do you know what makes the burled wood so beautiful? The burled wood is those parts of the tree where the tree has suffered a disease, where it's formed a knot, where it's had a tumor, where it has been twisted in the wind, where, where the tree has been broken and has healed itself. That's what causes the grain to be irregular in those places. And that's what makes it beautiful. And that way we're all like trees. If we live easy, boring lives, we don't really accomplish much for the kingdom of God. You know, the Bible says that everyone who tries to live a righteous life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution and hardship. And it's precisely those times of difficulty in our lives where God is building character in us and building our faith to greater and greater levels, giving us experiences of the grace of God that we can share with other people who are in need, forming us into unique individuals. <laughs> you know, I said to my wife the other day, it can hardly be true that our best contribution to heaven will be having an easy life in which we never spend a day in prison for our faith. None of us go looking for trouble. But our faith requires us to live in trouble with the conviction that God is the master of our fate. That God knows what God is doing. That God knows what, the, what purpose he will bring in the midst of tragedy and trouble and hardship. A few moments ago, I was telling you about the greatest shame of my life. The shame that I had been a child racist. Yet that greatest shame of my life, God chose to convert into the greatest honor that I ever experienced. And I can tell you that God is a specialist in turning defeat into victory. That is the paradox of the cross. That Jesus dying for our sins made possible our salvation. As I said before, a lot of people are angry at God because of the things that they've suffered. They don't understand why God would allow them to go through so many things. Why they had to lose their father or mother why their marriage didn't succeed, why their child died at an early age, why tragedy struck, why they suffered a disease, why they failed at the thing they wanted to achieve. Sometimes people, rather than facing those things by turning to God, will turn away from God. And I want to say to you that Jesus, when he died on the cross, bore on himself both our sins and our sorrows. Isaiah chapter 53 says, surely he bore our sorrows and he was bruised for our sins. And the salvation that brought us, the, 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 the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his stripes we were healed. Healed of our sins and healed of our sufferings. And the fact that Jesus bore our sufferings on the cross means that we have no reason to reject Jesus and every reason to accept him. 
The fact that Jesus bore our sins on the cross means that God has no reason to reject us. The penalty of our sins has been paid. And God wants, through the mystery of the cross, to turn all of our lives, all of our shame, all of our sin, all of our suffering into our greatest victory.